All right, we're going to be in Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20. And we're going to see two visions here. Uh, it's a grain harvest vision and a grape harvest vision. Okay, we're going to look at those two things tonight. And I'm going to start by reading verse 14. It says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and seated on the cloud, one like a son of man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. All right, so this title, Son of Man, that image is brought from the Old Testament in the book of Daniel, and specifically Daniel 7.13, where it says there's uh, one like Son of Man coming on the clouds. Okay, that's a reference to Jesus, the risen Christ. And just as the Son of Man is seen coming with the clouds in heaven, in the book of Daniel, we see that here Jesus is seated on the cloud, and it mentions that at least three times here by my counting. And what is Jesus doing? He's demonstrating his power and his glory, and he is both redeemer and he's a judge. Okay, He's the lamb who takes away the sin of the world, but he's also the lion of Judah. <coughs> he's also the victorious ram, right? So he's wearing a golden crown, and what does that symbolize? What does a crown symbolize? Kingship. Kingship, authority, right? So he has absolute authority, and what is he holding? Sharp sickle. A sharp sickle. And that represents, every time you see it, represents an instrument of judgment, right? When you, when you look at the prophets in the Old Testament, they say the same thing. All right, any questions there on verse 14? <coughs> All right, verses 15 and 16 says, And another angel came out of the temple, so in other words, it's coming from God, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. All right, remember, who is sitting on the cloud? Jesus. Jesus. So this angel comes out and gives Jesus some instructions, right? He's not commanding Jesus, but we're getting the benefit of this message, right? Jesus needs no commands, but in order for John to understand what's going on, he has to hear these things, right? He has to see these things and witness them. And he communicates it to, ultimately to us, because we're reading it tonight. So this angel comes from God. It says it comes from the temple and what is the nature of this harvest? Now, he says, put in your sickle and reap. Okay, this is the first vision in the short passage we're looking at tonight. So the question is, what is the nature of this harvest? What is the nature of the grape harvest that we're about to see? Are they one and the same? Are they explaining each other? Or is one for the righteous, which a lot of people think the first one's for the righteous judgment, and is a second judgment for the unrighteous, the unbelievers. Now, let me just offer some options for us, okay? If we say that this first judgment that we just read, the harvest judgment, is for believers, for the righteous. All right, here's what it has going for it. Number one, this action is taken by Jesus himself, not an angel, right? Number two, the image of the grain harvest is used in other places in a positive light. For example, in Matthew 9 and in John 4, we see very similar language, but it's, it's in positive uh, connotations. Third, the description of the 144,000 that we saw earlier in this chapter, they were called the first fruits, right? Which kind of makes you think, well, maybe there's another harvest coming later. If these are the first fruits, what's the next harvest? Fourth, in the second vision, the one we're about to get to with the grapes the grapes are harvested and then they're trampled on but when the grain here is harvested it, it's not threshed it's not winnowed and it's not burned okay so that the people who say this is for the righteous this is what it has going for it does that make sense to everybody okay any questions there and if you ask me is that the correct interpretation i will tell you maybe Okay. All right. So let's look at the other side. What about judgment for 
unbelievers. There, so there's a lot of people who argue that this first one, this first vision, is talking about unbelievers just like the second one. Okay, and they're saying the second vision explains the first vision. All right, so let's let's look at the argument for that. One, it says one like a son of man here. That we know that's Jesus. It says he will return to judge as well as to redeem. So we know Jesus is Savior, but he, we also know from the book of Revelation, we know from other passages in the New Testament, <coughs> Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back again, he is bringing judgment with him. Okay, we do know that. Second, the harvest metaphor is not limited to gathering the righteous. Even though you see a couple other places where it's used in a positive light, that does not necessarily mean that it's a positive light right here, right? So we, have, we can't make the mistake of a logical fallacy just because it says it somewhere else and uses it in a positive way does not necessarily mean. I'll give you another example of that we see in the Bible. Sometimes leaven is used in a positive sense, and sometimes leaven is used in a negative sense to describe sin. All right? So you can't, you can't take it for one or the other all, you know, all the time. All right, what about the term first fruits? We saw that in verse 4 in this chapter. It refers to the redemption of all believers. That's what we talked about. We, we all agreed on that. All Christians it does not necessitate a reference to a greater harvest that would come later on. Okay. Just because it uses the word first fruits doesn't mean there's another for the righteous later on. Does that make sense? Okay. Fourth, the, it mentions the time or the hour in verse 15. This reaping occurs 10 times in Revelation, this, this image. And usually when, it's, when that image occurs, it's with reference to the judgment of the wicked, not the righteous. Okay. And then finally, both passages are patterned after Joel 3.13. All right, so both of those visions. Let me read Joel 3.13 to you. It says this. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. So we know without a doubt the second vision is about the unrighteous, right? The wicked. The one we have question about is the first vision. All right, so let's continue there. Both of these passages are patterned after that, right? The mention of sickle in both of these visions also suggests that both of them are based on Joel 3.13. That's where the imagery is coming from. The Joel passage is the only passage in the, New in the Old Testament. It's the only place in the Old Testament where you see harvesting with a sickle spoken as figuratively. Not a literal harvest, but it's a figurative picture, right? And that's what we would have to say is the same thing that's happening in Revelation. It's not a literal harvesting. It's a figurative picture of what's going to happen, a judgment, right? Other places in Revelation, we see uh, two visions happening back to back. We see the second vision giving more light on the first vision. You know, it's the same thing. It's just explaining it more in detail. Uh, if you want to look at it, Revelation 7 is a good example of that. In both of these visions, if, if both of these indicate judgment, then this doubling would point to the severity of the judgment. And one thing we can all agree on is that when God brings this judgment, it will be absolutely severe. There will be no more, no more chances, right? No more waiting around. So, I say all that to say this. Which is it? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I lean towards the second one, that uh, the second interpretation that it's all about the judgment of the unrighteous, the unbelievers. Okay, the believers are already been talked about. I believe now it's talking about unbelievers in both of those visions. Both harvests are talking about that. All right, but I'm not saying you have to say that. It's an option, right? I don't know the clear answer. Well, I would think that if he was coming after redeemed, I wouldn't want him to come with a sickle. No, no. <laughs> uh, like I said, it always brings up an image of judgment, yeah. Yeah, especially looking at yeah. Joel. All right. All right, let's go to the second vision. Look at verse 17. Then another angel 
came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who, angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So God now sends another angel as an agent of judgment. He sends a sickle, right? And since he uh, holds that sickle, he's going to do something with it. And then as he's doing that, another angel comes out to explain what he's doing, to instruct the first angel so we can know this judgment is coming from God. And this is what he's doing. And it might be, I'm just going to say it might be a response to the prayers of God's people for vindication. But we talked about that before. When God uses the prayers of the saints to act later, right? We saw that before. Now, what about fire? What is fire almost certainly an image of? You know. Judgment. Judgment. Fire is always in connection with, with judgment in the Bible. All right, so that's happening. This is the... Uh, the second gathering, and it says, Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. And we want to, we want to know, what, what are they ripe for? Okay, so let's look at verses 19 and 20. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So what is it ripe for? Wrath. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Okay? So let's, uh, let's talk about what that means. In biblical times, if you were going to harvest grapes and make wine, you would take the bunches of grapes and take them to a wine, what is called a winepress. So it's basically a pit, you know, more or less speaking, a pit. You throw them all in there, and then you tramp on them, right? You either use your own feet, which people still today, they, that's one of the ways they make wine. They step on it with their bare feet. Uh, but what happens is when you do that, and you press the juice, the grape juice runs to uh, one end of that pit, and there's a little channel, a little hole in it. It'll run into a vessel to be collected, and then they will you know, start the fermenting process to make the wine. So you have this image here, but it's not literal, it's figurative, right? It's talking about something else. So the wine press represents God's judgment on the wicked, on the unbelievers, on his enemies. And how do we know that beyond what it says right here? Well, if you know the rest of the Bible and you study the rest of the Bible, it becomes very clear that this image is used in other places. Uh, places like Isaiah 63 Joel 3, which we talked about a while ago, which is almost a direct image of what we see here. And then also in Lamentations 1.15. So in Revelation 19.15, if you go back to verse 15, it's Jesus himself who treads the winepress of the fury of God, the wrath of God. Now we see this trampling occurring by an angel, right? A servant, a messenger. But where is it taking place? Where does it say this is this wine press is? Verse twenty. Outside of the city, which brings up another image, right? If you go all the way back to the covenant, if you go back to the covenant relationship God had between Himself and Israel, any time He said that people either willingly unwillingly or they were being punished if they're going to go outside the covenant what do they always say they were cut off from the people they were outside of the community they were put out right you have the same image here the wine press was trodden outside of the city so this means that this has to be talking about the wicked even though it says it very plainly for us all right so it's a separation and what about the bloodshed now, that's a lot of blood, right? And that, 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 it gives us that image on purpose. This is talking about severity of the judgment. It's talking, and, and what is 1,600 stadia? 
180 miles. Yeah, I got yeah, I got that a note on that. 184 miles is what I have. It says a stadium was about 607 feet or 185 meters. So, and it says it's as high as a horse's bridle. So this is meant to convey a graphic description of the amount of bloodshed, which adds to the horror, the absolute horror of this image. The judgment of God is nothing to laugh at and nothing to play around with. It is very, very, very serious. So, gentle Jesus, meek and mild? Not always. Not always. He is the Savior, but he's also the judge. And we do have to remember that as his people, as Christians, as, as church people. We have to remember both, right? He is the lion and the lamb. Just read the chapter uh, 20, uh, 23 of the Matthew. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Read that so, so God is going to vindicate his people, right? He's going to judge the unrighteous. Evil will not win. Even though if you look around in our world, it's, it's crazy. It's a mess. It's, it's evil, right? And, and it's not just on one front. It's everywhere. But here's the good news. Evil will not win. We've already talked about it. It's going to basically self-destruct. God's going to judge it. It's going to all fall apart. And God's going to throw all that into the lake of fire. Second thing we need to remember is that we should adopt an appropriate attitude towards the judgment of God. Like I said a while ago, it's nothing to laugh at. It's very serious. It's nothing that we should wish on anybody. That's why it's so important that we pray for one another, pray for our lost friends, keep calling out to God on their behalf, that God would be merciful and God would save them. It's a somber reality, and we should never, ever forget that's a very serious thing. It's an eternal thing. So it's just something we have to keep in mind. We have to keep that in mind.